that we love. Um, this is a poem I wrote when I was at the center and I was um, thinking about, um, this was one of those moments when, um, you know, you write a poem and you, you think it's maybe a little odd and that maybe people cannot relate to it. And then you read it and people walk up to you and they say, oh my gosh, how, how did you know? Like, you know, you've written a poem about their childhood when you think you were writing a poem about your own childhood. And it was um, when I wrote this poem that I, and I was reading it to some, some people at the, at the center that I, I realized how, how often we have a, an odd experience in life and we think it's unique to us, but you know, lots of people have had it. And it was so warming to my heart mm -hmm. to realize that there was probably no feeling or experience that I have had in this world that someone else has not had somewhere. It just gave me such a, a sense of unity and support. So this was one of those, those poems from my childhood that, um, no, I shouldn't read it because it's, okay, no, I will read it. So you, so I had this thing where I, I re read novels, you know, and I, re I realized, okay, here's the format of novels. They set the tone, there's a problem, the problem gets solved, and then there's resolution. <laughs> and I thought, that's brilliant. So I do it with my poetry quite a bit as a, as a, as a vehicle, you know, to come to some higher ground, to come to, come to some deeper understanding, so. Um, this one's called Wash the Mud Away. I remember being a child, careful lest I, real, I reveal the real me. Old, long, old, I'm going to read it because I can't remember it. Old, been here long time woman, trapped in a child's body. Silent. Afraid of awakening their fear or disbelief or jealousy. And so we grow to be adults, hiding our jewels in the mud basket. Perhaps when future days come, we will reach for the stars and pluck enough courage down from the sky to light up the whole stream and wash the mud away. Good. Yeah. Now, Telly, you just let me know when you're ready to hop in here with some of I'll, yours. I'll jump in. I, I have one that okay. uh, uh, a meditation teacher with, uh, used to read uh, when I was going living in Silver Spring. So this is uh, called The Clearing by Martha Postlewaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worth of rescue. Oh, wow. That's lovely. So that's Martha Postlewaite Thwaite. And it's oh, called Clearing. That's lovely. Yeah, that was a... <laughs> really nice. Good. Yeah. It kind of uh, puts you in a nice mood for meditation. Absolutely. Let's see, I'll read one of Kabir. Yeah. Oh, brother, my heart yearns for that true guru who fills the cup of true love and drinks of it himself and offers it then to me. He removes the veil from, my, from the eyes and gives the true vision of Brahma. He reveals the words in him and makes me to hear the unstruck music. He shows joy and sorrow to be one. He fills all utterance with love. Kabir says, 
Verily, he has no fear, who has such a guru to lead him to the shelter of safety. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big Kabir fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give him a big thumbs up. <laughs> So I'll, I'll turn it back to you. That's a couple of okay. my. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this one's called Building a Shrine. And I can't remember which one of these I've read for y'all before. So I apologize if I've read this before. Um, I was um, walking through the woods with some people and a man turned to me and he, who, whose name I did not know. And he said, my life so far has been like trying to put a very large love through a pinhole. And I said, oh, that's a good line. Can I have that? And he said, yes. And so I wrote a poem about it. And it turned out it was a man who brought the great Robert Bly here to Asheville. Mm. And it was seeing Robert Bly here in Asheville reading his Hafez poems that um, I realized that poetry was, was really meant to be heard with music because he was performing his Hafez poems with music. Mm. And I was, and I ended up recording a CD with a, that exact same group of people. So there was this lovely circle. Um, and I was struggling to get the end of the poem in a, I think I did read this poem not too long ago for y'all, but anyway, um, this feisty little four foot five fiddle player who was at my house, um, helping four, me. What, what, how big? She was four foot five and oh she was feisty. <laughs> <laughs> And she was helping me. She, she worked as a gardener during the day and as a fiddle player at night. She, and she, she and I were putting my garden in and I was sharing this poem with her. And I said, I, I'm usually pretty good about getting the end of poems, but I can't get it. And she felt a, she felt called to share um, a story. Tell I just, 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 just tell y'all this story before. I don't think so. She felt inspired to tell me a story about a woman that she knew who was her roommate who, who was dying of cancer at a fairly young age. And, she was walking on the beach and she um, she wanted to say thank you to God for her life. And so she built an altar out of found objects. And I was very moved by that story for some reason, mm -hmm. that someone who was young and dying would say thank you to God for their life and not be angry. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, so it inspired the end of this poem and um, which is uh, one of my favorite poems. And about five years later, after I wrote this poem, a Native American friend of mine said, Tracy, um, do you remember that woman that, that I introduced you to at a party who died shortly thereafter? He said, you were, you were clearly very struck by her. She reminded me so much of you. Um, people thought so much of her here in Asheville that we're having a 10 year memorial for her. Yeah, you know, who does that, right? Wow. So I go to the 10 year memorial of this woman that I had met at a party right before she died. And I realized that the woman I met at the party who died shortly thereafter was the woman that inspired this poem. She was the woman that, that this little fiddle player told me this story about. And what's remarkable about that is um, three days before I went to that party and met her, she crossed my path in a truck. And I thought, I don't know who that woman is, but she's my other half. She's my doppelganger. And I thought, okay, what, what, wait, wait a minute. You know, I just was confused by even having the feeling. And I said, I don't know who she is, but she's my, she's my other half. She's my doppelganger. And then I met her at a party three days later. And it turned out she was involved in poetry and Native Americans. <laughs> it blew my mind so badly to meet her that I couldn't look her in the eye when I, when I went to shake her hand. I was like, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. I, I could not look her in the eye because I knew that if I did, she would know who I was. It would freak her out as much as it was freaking me out. And that's the woman that died shortly after I met her. And that's the woman that inspired my poem. Five years after her death, she inspired one of my favorite poems. So anyway, it's called, it's called Building a Shrine. My life so far has been like trying to put a very large love through a pinhole. I have tried to make myself small enough to fit into this world, but finally the shell has rent in two and the shrine of my being has emerged. We are guided home on an invisible thread. One day the distance 
between ourself and the whole simply disappears. And then the love fits perfectly. Mm -hmm. There is so much work to do in this world when we could simply choose to be ecstatically happy, to take rocks and driftwood and build an altar to all that is good inside of us and to set our one shining life on fire. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to hear that again, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. Tina, we're, um, we're, we're reading favorite poems um, and I thought there'd be more people on the call, so I pulled some of my own poems. Not, ne not that they're necessarily my favorite poems, but I'm reading my own poems. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll continue. And if you, if you have one that you'd like to, to read um, for us, just uh, wave your hand and um, we'll, we'll get you in on reading. So this one's called Building a Shrine. My life so far has been like trying to put a very large love through a pinhole. I have tried to make myself small enough to fit into this world, but finally the shell has rent in two and the shrine of my being has emerged. We are guided home on an invisible thread. One day the distance between ourself and the whole simply disappears and then the love fits perfectly. There is so much work to do in this world when we could simply choose to be ecstatically happy, to take rocks and driftwood and build an altar to all that is good inside of us and to set our one shining life on fire. Mm. It's kind of a Baba poem, isn't it? You know, like... Yeah, you got a lot of work to do, people, but come on. <laughs> Be happy amidst it. Amen. Tell you got one for us? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, miss, I got that one. I will just read a short roomy that I, I'd actually set to music, but I'll, it's nice to, to read it. Um, your true life. As you start to walk out on the way, the way appears. As you cease to be, true life begins. As you grow smaller, this world cannot contain you. You will be shown a being that has no you in it. Hmm. Rumi never fails to inspire me. Never fails. <laughs> the paradox. Oh, wait a minute. There's something happening. What's that? She wants to. I think she wants you to read it again. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> she, Tina, her her mic will not work. <laughs> okay, your true life. As you start to walk out on the way, the way appears. As you cease to be, true life begins. As you grow smaller, this world cannot contain you. You will be shown a being that has no you in it. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Thank you. You're welcome. Got another one for us? Oh, let's see. There was um hmm. I'll read a John O'Donohue poem. Mm, yeah. Uh let's see. I place on the altar of dawn the quiet loyalty of breath, the tent of thought where I shelter, 
waves of desire I am sure to, and all beauty drawn to the eye. May my mind come alive today to the invisible geography that invites me to new frontiers, to break the dead shell of yesterdays, to risk being disturbed and changed. May I have the courage today to live the life that I would love, to postpone my dream no longer, but do at last what I came here for and waste my heart on fear no more. Mm, waste my heart on fear no more. What a line. Amen. <laughs> wow. Wow. I don't know if y'all know this, but, uh, you know, John O'Donohue was a Catholic priest in, from Ireland. And um, he left the Catholic Church because of the, um, you know, revelation about how many um, priests had been involved in um, <clears throat> sexual abuse. So he left, he left the church because of that. Not because he didn't want to be a priest, but because he felt that the priesthood had been really sullied by it. And um, so he he went on to be a poet and a, and a writer and um, he, fe he fell in love and was about to get married for the first time in his life at 52. And two weeks before he was about to be married, he, he died of a heart attack. Wow. I think it's just such a poignant thing for such a, you know, remarkable human being whose work we all loved so much. Um, we were just talking about Krista Tippett's radio show, which is called On Being with Krista Tippett. You can just Google it. There's a fabulous interview there with Mary Oliver. That's really the best interview I've ever heard with her. And there's also a lovely interview there. The, John, the poet John O'Donohue. Mm -hmm. if you like. it's, I cannot recommend them more highly. They're so good. <clears throat> well, um, I'll jump back in unless Tina is going to raise her hand at some point in time. Um, so this is a poem. I think I read this poem before for y'all, but um, it's about forgiveness and um, it's called the end of the spear. And I, I think I told y'all the story, but um, uh, I just tell you the story about my neighbor cutting my shiitake, burning my shiitake logs. And then I went and got new shiitake logs from the other neighbor down the street. Um, well, I, went, I went down the street from, I lived in we land, I was living in Weaverville and um, there was an old house right down the street for me. And I thought it was probably the old farmhouse of the Weaver family. And one day I stopped by there to um, get some wood from him. He had just cut down an old oak tree and needed some shiitake logs. And um, it turned out, yes, this was the Weaver family. And um, I thought they were like farmers or something because Weaverville's kind of a country community but no he lived there with his aunt who was um had a phd in linguistics so he wouldn't take any money for um for the log so i went back the next day and gave her a copy of my poetry book and she wrote me a letter you know she lived half a mile down the road but she wrote me a letter and put it in the mailbox because she was in her 80s it was so cute and um she said i went to your website i saw the work you did with native people it reminded me of the work i did with and then she named these two tribes from ecuador that she had worked with well what was remarkable about this was jane and will stanhope and i some baba lovers had gone to see a movie years ago it was called the end of the spear and it was a true story which you can get on netflix and um, it was a story about these two tribes in Ecuador who had a very weird um, belief system that if someone killed a member of your family, you had both the right and the responsibility to kill a member of their family in exchange. Which, I mean, really is kind of like out the world today, right? And so these two tribes were killing each other off. And the the Ecuadorian government was going to relocate one of the tribes from their ancestral grounds and some people from America heard about this and they said may we go down and talk to them about forgiveness before you relocate them and they said well you have 30 days you know so they go they go down in this uh plane that can land on the river in this very remote part of Ecuador these people had rarely seen non-tribal people and they start having a conversation they had learned some of the language and the entire group of men, there were six men, one of them had a Super 8 camera. The entire group of men were murdered within a few hours. They were speared to death. 
through a, because of a misunderstanding. And the wives of the men who were murdered went to retrieve the bodies of their husbands. And they found the Super 8 camera and they saw what had happened. And they were so committed to teaching forgiveness that they decided to go and live among the people who had murdered their husbands and to teach forgiveness to those people. Wow. I know, right? I was like, okay, now, now this, now I'm really interested because now those people are serious, you know. So um, I won't tell you what happens in the rest of the movie, but it is a documentary about that experience. And it turns out that my neighbor who lived in the old farmhouse, who was a weaver, a family member from Weaverville, was one of those women who went to live among those people and she lived there for 30 years. Just an incredible story, just so incredible. Um, so anyway, I, I named it in honor of her because I was so impressed that someone would do that and it's called The End of the Spear. And um, it was also inspired by by Baba, I was at the center one day and I was, the word forgiveness just kept repeating itself. Like, you know, just kept coming in front of me over and over and over again. And I became nervous that somehow there was someone I hadn't forgiven and I didn't realize it. And I, and in fact, that was true. And so anyway, end of the spear. Roll the stone away from the tomb where your heart has lain for eons. It has become an incubating grief, which at your own hand has become a weapon. Running from yourself at all costs, discovering too late that you have become a tourist instead of a pilgrim or loud instead of powerful. Given up for dead, but only sleeping. Coax yourself awake again by leaning into your sure and eventual release. The thorn lodged into that once tender spot has fallen out now from the sound of your own voice. Mm. That which flowers on the vine wants to remind you that this beauty was always meant for you. Nothing lightens the weight of the world like dropping the spear we point against ourselves. Consider becoming your own wild and faithful companion. Turn out the light you have left on night after sleepless night because of fear and watching the star veil hatch a firmament, listen. The stars are speaking their love language saying, forgive yourself. That's beautiful. I have a poem. Oh, good. Hop in there, Tina. Hi, I, uh, this is E.E. E. Cummings. I hope I can do it justice because the punctuation is very weird. <laughs> <laughs> I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I'm never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful you are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. This is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. Mm. Lovely. Beautiful, yeah. 
Mm. Mm. It's it's so simple, but it's it's beauty, isn't it? Simplicity. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Mm. Here's one that um, I recorded with music. Let me see if it'll play for us. It's called Make a List. I wrote it at the center. It's an MP3 file. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here it comes. Make a list of things you love. Swirling flowers curled into buds about to bloom. A friend's gorgeous hair. Your own soul on fire. Let them reach in and lift the pressing weariness of this world. Releasing the false belief that your infant that your life is was ever meant to be a burden. Releasing the false belief tender infant that your life is was ever meant to be a burden. In this new year, open the tiny buds. Watch them transfer their fragrant joy. Brush one beautiful strand after another and repeat. Freedom is the open mouth of my life and is everywhere shouting for more. Like a moth. Step into the light of your own fire, waiting to burst into flames. Like a prayer, ready to leave this world more beautiful than when we came into it. Very nice, Tracy. Who, who's the the musicians? Um, remember me telling you that I saw Robert Bly and he was playing with a band, um, yeah. and I and I was so well. It was that band. Oh, neat. That band. Uh, are, we're lo are local, and they actually. I wish uh, Ferris Tate was here. They actually play with uh, a Grammy award winning uh, musician from Turkey, and they travel all over the world. They're just fabulous. Hmm. Um, they're called Free Planet Radio. And I was looking for the button. There's, I, I know there's a button so that the um, 
microphone goes directly. Do y'all, does anybody remember how to do that? Because I kept looking for it and I could not figure it out. I mean, I realize it's too late, but I, I, I have to try to remember how to do this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I have a CD and it's called Returning Home and it's uh, my work in Rumi and Hafez. Mm. Um, to music. Mostly Middle Eastern inspired music. Okay, so you're you're hearing the music and you're reading to the music, as it were, in a sense. Uh, we recorded the music and the poem at the same time. At the same time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Which is which is a really nice thing to do when you're reading poetry because um, because then you you really develop a different kind of synergy and the poem can kind of ride in on the rhythm of the music and so it's a it's a lovely. It's a lovely combination to do. Um, and it's it's sort of how poetry is done in the Middle East. They usually perform it to music. Right. There. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, if nobody has anything, I'll jump in and I'll read you uh, one of my newest. It was inspired by... Um, Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote a book called Call Me By My True Name. Mm. Remember your true name, the one you gave yourself long ago, the one you read, written in the sky on a moonless night, earth trembling underneath your feet, the one you hear when silence gives way to remembrance which gives way to the kind of knowing that allows you to answer, to call yourself by your true name. That's your poem, you said? Yes, it, yes, it was, yes, it was a poem I wrote um, inspired by Thich Nhat Hans, the oh. title of Thich Nhat Hans' book. That's wonderful. I love that idea, your true name. I know, me too. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll, can, I'll carry on unless someone has one that they would like to bring, bring in. I have a roomy. <laughs> it's a long one though. You know, yeah, a long, long is fine. Well, I don't know. Is it too long? <laughs> Maybe it's too long. <laughs> How many pages is it? Oh, I don't know. It's on my phone. <laughs> if it's your favorite poem, you can read it. Ah, <laughs> I can't say it's my favorite poem. It's it's one I like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For ages you have come and gone courting, courting this delusion. For ages you have run from the pain and forfeited the ecstasy. So come, return to the root of the root of your own soul. Although you appear in earthly form, your essence is pure consciousness. You are the fearless guardian of divine light. So come, return to the root of the root of your own soul. When you lose all sense of self, the bonds of a thousand chains will vanish. Lose yourself completely. Return to the root of the root of your own soul. You descended from the pure word of God, but you turn your sight to the empty show of this world. Alas, how can you be satisfied with so little? So come. Return to the root of the root of your own soul. Why are you so enchanted by this world when a mine of gold lies within you? Open your eyes and come. Return to the root of the root of your own soul. You were born from the rays of God's majesty when the stars were in their perfect place. How long will you suffer from the blows of a non-existent hand? So come, 
return to the root of the root of your own soul. You are a ruby encased in a granite. How long will you deceive us with this outer show? Oh friend, we can see the truth in your eyes. So come, return to the root of the root of your own soul. After one moment with that glorious friend, you became loving, radiant, and ecstatic. Your eyes were sweet and full of fire. Come, return to the root of the root of your own soul. The king of the tavern has handed you an eternal cup, and God in all his glory is pouring the wine. So come, drink, return to the root of the root of your own soul. Soul of all souls, life of all life, you are that. Seen and unseen, moving and unmoving, you are that. The road that leads to the city is endless. Go without head and feet, and you'll already be there. What else could you be? You are that. Hmm. Yeah, that was fabulous. That was amazing. That was great. Beautiful reading. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity. Well, we have time for one more, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, this is one about, um, this is one about listening. Um, I, I think a lot about the word silence and, um, you know, it seems to me that if we're not listening to that silence, then it's kind of lost on us. So to me, listening is a really important, um, quality to develop um, as spiritual aspirants. The moon comes from its quiet corner of the sky and shines like a lantern unto all this beauty we are surrounded by. Like old friends illuminating the love that ripples on the surface of still waters. Making even silence seem alive and in dialogue with what remains unspoken among us. Overhead, a group of birds in prayer glide by, fishing for flashes of silver. They leave messages in the sky like a secret language. We sit in a world that is both known and unknown, that is both the chasm and the light. Shadows haven't the power to overcome the sun, thankfully. We are happy here. It's the best kind of listening, which we give ourselves to more and more, which we hold with both hands, tenuously, ardently, as if everything depends on it, as if everything does. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being on the call. So appreciate um, yeah. your attentiveness. And um, Elaine, it was kind of fun to have you on and not like not be able to, <laughs> to have you make gestures so that we could figure out what you were thinking. <laughs> it's like, uh, like an oracle, you know, you... <laughs> <laughs> Usually a lovely experience. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> have you all have a? Oh, call you want me to call you? Yes, I'll do that. Um, so everyone, I hope you have a, a great week. And um, I hope that you have some way to stay warm in this cold weather. I don't know about where it is with you are, but where you are, but it is cold here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and poetry is one of the ways I, my heart stays happy and keeps keeps it warm. So thank you for being part of that. Thank you for 
posting this weekend. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. It's I really love it. Poetry. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Lucky. Thank you, Elaine. Jay Baba, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a good week. You too.